Well, hello, class. This is Professor Khan joining you once again. Uh, today, I'd like to just walk through the instructions for your second paper, paper number two, over character and conflict. And uh, we call uh, this kind of paper a progressive paper. Um, what we're going to do in paper two is really add on to what you've already done in paper number one. So you'll be writing over the same uh, story in paper two as you did in paper number one. So if you wrote about Sonny's Blues in paper one, you will continue writing about Sonny's Blues in paper two. And if you wrote about Paul's case in paper one, you'll continue writing about Paul's case in paper two. Um, you know, I know everyone uh, can read <laughs> the uh, the directions, but it is sort of helpful to kind of uh, talk you through them as well. If you have any questions about the instructions for paper two, uh, please don't hesitate to email me. Or, uh, you know, if you think that your question and the answer might benefit others, feel free to post uh, your question in the discussion board and we'll get it answered there. So with this essay, we're going to continue working on the concept of formalism. We're focusing on the elements of fiction known as character and conflict. And we're going to be relating those two elements to the story's central idea. And this is one of the things that formalism is concerned with. It's certainly not the only thing. Formalism can encompass any number of possible uh, analyses and arguments having to do with the form that a story takes. Uh, but this is one of the ways that it does that. Um, for review of you know formalism, please go back to module one and check out that central idea part one slideshow and presentation. And of course, if you want to get uh, another review of the central idea itself, uh, that is really focused more in part two of the central idea slideshow. And of course, we're going to be talking about central idea really throughout the term. So let's kind of give you a summary of the instructions for this paper. You're going to continue to explore either Sonny's Blues or Paul's case. You are going to take your accepted paper one and add on additional material, in particular an analysis of character and an analysis of conflict. And you're going to demonstrate how these two elements of fiction help the reader understand the story's central idea. And you'll be doing this by employing some cause and effect argumentation. Um, that will be, uh, we'll, we'll kind of uh, explain that and show you examples of that in another presentation. And we'll, we'll have a, a separate presentation introducing you to character terms and concepts, uh, as well as conflict terms and concepts. So you want to review all of those presentations before you, you know, sit down to start seriously writing this paper. Um, you know, before viewing those presentations, uh, reread the story. Uh, make sure that you've got a, a good paper one. You know, once you get paper one back from me, uh, you want to hop on any edits or revisions that you need to do because Step one, as you can see here, of paper two is taking your paper one material that's been accepted and beginning paper two with it. So paper two is the first page and a half is going to be exactly like your paper one. Remember the policy for the class. You have to submit paper two by the deadline, but I'm not going to read it or grade it until paper one has been accepted. And that makes particular sense, good sense, I think, here with these first two papers. You don't want to 
you know, tack on a, an unaccepted rough draft plot summary and central idea uh, that maybe you turned in originally for paper one. You don't want to take that and, and incorporate that into paper two. You want the plot summary and the central idea statement of your chosen story to have been accepted already in paper one, and you want to take that and make that step one of paper two. Okay, uh, and of course we have a uh, sample essay uh, up in module two, and it is like the sample essay for paper one over the Raymond Carver story, Cathedral. And you will see that in that sample paper two, uh, the first page and a half looks exactly like the sample paper one, right? It's just the plot summary of Cathedral followed by the one sentence central idea statement. So it's really with step two that we start getting some more original writing going. This paper is about character and conflict. So it's sort of divided into, after, we, we could, after we're done with the plot summary stuff, um, it's really sort of divided into two parts. We're gonna have some paragraphs, at least two paragraphs about character and at least two paragraphs about conflict. So to begin step two, you're gonna start writing about the protagonist. The protagonist is a term that refers to the main or the central character of a story. And we want at least one paragraph here. You can certainly write more than one paragraph uh, if you'd like, but at least one. Uh, so first you'll begin with a topic sentence, just one sentence that identifies who that protagonist is just simply tell us who the main character is. That's going to be the paragraph's main point, the topic sentence of, the, of this paragraph. Then you want to start defining that protagonist. And you're going to use character terms like round or flat, dynamic or static. And again, uh, there's a, a separate presentation that will be available to you that covers what these terms mean. Round basically means, you know, a character that has an interesting background, a character that has multiple personality traits. Flat is a character that really doesn't have that, just a sort of a one note character. A dynamic character is a character that changes significantly over the course of the story. A static character is a character that really doesn't change. So you want to indicate you know what is this protagonist is this a round character or a flat character can't be both it's going to be one or the other uh, is this character a dynamic character or a static character can't be both it's going to be either one or the other so you will make those claims you will make those i guess we can call these claims of definition about the protagonist but then you need to illustrate and that just means to give examples using textual evidence. Textual evidence refers to quotes or paraphrases. This is when you sort of put it in your own words. Quotes and paraphrases from the story itself that seem to support these definitions. So if you claim that a character is round, I need you to show me that in the story. Where do we see the character the character's roundness? Where do we see evidence that the character is round? If you say that a character is static, doesn't change, you need to show me that evidence from the story. Uh, you can give additional information about the character. You know, you can talk about what the character looks like, what the background of the character is, other personality traits. I wouldn't spend too long on that. The main point of this paragraph, the main job, is to define the protagonist in terms of being round or flat and in terms of being dynamic or static. When you give that illustration, that evidence, you want to follow that up with explanation. Don't let the evidence speak for itself. We need to know that you chose those quotes or chose those moments from the story to illustrate the point that you're trying to make. So after you give 
the examples after you give that illustration in the form of textual evidence explain yourself how is it that this illustration how is it that, th that this quote how is it that this um, part of the story that you're, you're sort of summarizing and paraphrasing for us how does it illustrate or show the definitions that you've applied to the protagonist again don't let the textual evidence speak for itself so what we're using here is what we call the pie pattern. And you may have learned about this in another writing class. Uh, different professors use different cutesy acronyms for this. Um, it really just depends. But the pie pattern means point, illustrate, and explain. And the pie pattern is a, a simple, elegant, and excellent way to develop a paragraph. And it's a good way to analyze. You know, we're, we're, we're wanting to make some sort of analytical point. We want to illustrate that using evidence from the text, in this case, the short story. And then we want to explain ourselves. We want to explain how that illustration shows the point that we're making. OK, so after that, step step two and again we need at least one paragraph of that you may find that you need to write two paragraphs uh, if you find that you're writing a lot in that paragraph you can split that up into two that's fine but in short order we need to move on to three step three is when you are going to take that information about the protagonist and discuss how that protagonist and what we now understand about the protagonist, how that helps a reader understand the central idea of the story. And again, this will be one, at least one paragraph of writing. So as before, you will begin with a topic sentence. And your topic sentence will simply state that the main character helps cause the central idea to emerge. Please put that in your own words, but this highlighted bit here is exactly what you are going to say in the first topic sentence of this paragraph. Notice this is an example of what we call a claim of cause and effect. We're, we're making a claim that is an opinion, a claim that the character as written helps bring about or cause the story's central idea. It's certainly not the only thing causing the central idea to emerge or to be made manifest in the reader's mind, but it is one factor. This sentence is the topic sentence. It's the paragraph's main point. Remember, we're using the pie pattern really throughout this paper. So we begin by making our point, first thing, first sentence. Then we illustrate, once again, using that textual evidence. Now, you may have already brought up some of these ideas in the previous paragraph, so you can refer back to these ideas, or you can bring up new evidence, new quotes, new parts of the story that you think are relevant here. I wouldn't quote something in step two and then quote it again in step three. I would quote it in step two and then paraphrase it in step three or, or simply refer back to it in step three. So you don't want to be too repetitive with that. Then we explain ourselves, right? We need to explain how this character and what we're saying about the character in terms of the definitions, how this contributes to the central idea. And this is where you're really going to be doing your core arguing. You're going to be using cause and effect argumentation. And once again, we'll have a separate video presentation that walks you through an example of this. Uh, we're going to use the story of an hour by Kate Chopin to walk us through that. Um, we're going to show how the character, given what we've already said about the character, given what we've already written about that character, how that stuff leads to the central idea. You want to make sure that the evidence you choose supports your causal or cause and effect logic and make sure to discuss and explain the connections as specifically as you can. 
And one of the things we're going to urge you to do, and which we'll talk about in that that uh, that other presentation, is you always want to be referring back to the central idea. You don't want to forget about that. That's going to be the tail end of step one, but it's that central idea statement that you're always going to be coming back to and connecting, making connections to in the body of this essay as well as future essays. So once again, we're following that classic PI pattern of analytical development. We make a point, we illustrate it with textual evidence from the story, and then we explain ourselves. All right, once you're done with step three, you're done writing uh, specifically about character, and now you're gonna move on to conflict. Now, conflict and character are very closely related to each other. So you may find that you're gonna be referring back to some of this character stuff here in step four and step five, that's fine. Again, as long as you're uh, trying not to be too intentionally repetitive with your evidence, uh, that's fine. So step four mirrors step two in many ways. Ex instead of writing about character, we're gonna write about conflict. But we're gonna spend this paragraph, and again, at least one paragraph, maybe two, but at least one. I think one should probably do the trick for you. Um, in this paragraph, we're going to simply define what the primary conflict is. So again, we're gonna have a separate video presentation explaining terms and concepts related to conflict. We'll have a separate video presentation with terms and concepts about character, and you wanna watch those and study that a little bit before you know, sitting down to write uh, paragraphs. Certainly take notes. You know, Part of the writing process is just jotting down notes and kind of random chaotic ideas. You should be doing that um, as you know, soon as you possibly can once you've got the paper assignment in front of you. Uh, but in terms of understanding the uh, the terminology and the concepts, you know, you want to you want to watch these presentations first. So we begin. We're following the pie pattern. So we'll begin with our topic sentence that gives our main point, and that sentence is simply going to be a sentence that identifies the story's primary conflict. There are always multiple conflicts going on in stories. Your job in paper two is simply to identify the primary conflict. Then you want to support this by defining what kind of conflict it is. And this might even be part of your topic sentence, part of the main point. Is the conflict an external conflict or an internal conflict? Very simply, an external conflict is when the main character the protagonist is in conflict with somebody or something outside of itself. An internal conflict is when the character is internally conflicted. There are conflicting uh, motivations, conflicting impulses, conflicting character traits, what have you. So you want to indicate what is in conflict against what, or who is in conflict against who, or who is in conflict against what. You know, whatever whatever the case may be, there's all kinds of conflicts out there in, in terms of short stories. Uh, go ahead and indicate this in sort of an X versus Y sentence. You know, the conflict is X versus Y. Okay, then, of course, we need you to prove that to us by illustrating with textual evidence, give us some examples that seem to illustrate the conflict in the story. Again, these can be direct quotes, can be you sort of paraphrasing, you know, plot points of the story. Um, they say variety is the spice of life, right? So that's true when we give textual evidence. You don't only want to quote, you don't only want to paraphrase, you kind of want to mix it up a little bit if you can. Remember, that a primary conflict is always going to involve the protagonist, right? So some of the stuff that you wrote about the protagonist might be relevant. It will be relevant to discussing the conflict. Character traits that you called out in the earlier paragraphs, 
you know, you might need to refer to again when you're defining and, and sort of exploring and explaining the main conflict that this protagonist is involved in. If it's an external conflict, you know, indicate who or what the protagonist is in conflict with. Uh, you might need to write about a secondary character. If it's an external conflict with another character. If it's an internal conflict, that's a little trickier. Here, you're going to need to indicate the two, I should have written two or more, uh, traits or impulses or motivations within the protagonist that are in conflict with each other. Uh, you can't simply write, you know, the conflict is internal, it's the protagonist versus himself, or it's the protagonist versus herself, or something like that. That's not enough. That's, that's skimming the surface. We really need to dive a little deeper and try to indicate, well, what parts of that character are in conflict with what other parts of that character. Then you explain yourself, right? You point back to that evidence and you explain to your readers uh, how those quotes, how those moments in the story that you called up show or illustrate your definitions. Right? If you think it's an external conflict, say so. Give us an example or two or three that seems to illustrate external conflict and then explain why you think this is evidence that shows external conflict. Do not let the evidence speak for itself. We're following the pie pattern once again. Then finally, in step four, we are wrapping up our essay and we're going to argue about how that conflict connects with and in fact helps to cause the central idea to sort of pop out at the end of the story. We'll, we'll use the pie pattern. We'll begin with our topic sentence that illustrates, I'm sorry, uh, expresses our main point. And once again, this is going to be sort of a cause and effect claim that you're making. Conflict helps cause the central idea to emerge. That's all you have to say here in this first sentence of step five. Say it in your own way, please. Don't just copy and paste what I have highlighted here. But saying it in your own way, as long as you're communicating a cause and effect relationship between conflict and central idea, that should be good. That's our paragraph's main point. Then we'll illustrate that point by giving textual evidence from the story. You may have found by now that you've um, used a lot of evidence, <laughs> a lot of quotes, a lot of bits of the story. Um, if you find something new, feel free to bring it up. If you find that um, you know evidence, illustrations that you've already mentioned in earlier paragraphs are going to be useful. Go ahead and refer to those ideas, refer back to that evidence. You don't need to re-quote it for us, just refer back to it. Then you want to explain how this conflict contributes to the central idea. So here's where you will use your cause and effect argumentation skill to show us how the conflict, which you've already written about in the previous paragraph, leads to or helps create the central idea. Make sure that the evidence that you have selected supports your cause and effect or causal logic. And make sure that you're explaining yourself very carefully and specifically. Again, we'll talk about this in the cause and effect argumentation presentation. All right. Uh, after you do this steps, uh, sorry, step five paragraph, um, you don't need to do any sort of formal conclusion. We'll just make this your last paragraph. We do want you to cite. So in paper one, you 
we're asked to create a works cited page citation for your story. We didn't grade it. We're not going to grade it for paper one, but we're commenting on it. We want, we want you to get it down right, and we want you to put that in the end of paper two. Now, in-text citation, this is when we cite within the paragraphs of the essay itself. Um, this one's a little tricky. So the majority of you are using the uh, digital textbook, you know, through Blackboard. And there really aren't page numbers associated with that. There, there is a table of contents, and it does tell you, you know, what page a story begins on. And that all corresponds to the print book. But at least from what I have seen looking at the digital textbook, you know, as you're scrolling down reading a story, it's not like it's going through page numbers. You can't really see what page you're on. So normally we would ask you to, you know, use parenthetical citations. Those are citations in parentheses at the end of a sentence, usually at the end of a sentence. And that is oftentimes going to have a page number in it. Uh, but if you're using the digital textbook, you know, I'm not really going to require that. If you're using a print book, then I would like you to put in page numbers. We're also only using one source. It's the story. We're not using any outside sources, well, eventually, but not for paper two. So it's really not necessary to, you know, always remind us that you're getting this quote from Baldwin or you're getting this quote from Cather. Um, we know that, you know, that's obvious. That's been made obvious from, from the first page. So really, I, I wouldn't worry too much about in-text citation for this, for this paper. We'll, we'll talk about it a bit more when we get to um, a paper that requires some outside sources beyond the story. So again, just make sure you're studying the material that is in module two. Uh, I'll be adding some things um, over the next few days. And of course, ultimately, don't forget your MLA formatting. So, you know, I've been looking at some paper ones, of course, grading those and noticing that a lot of people are not getting formatting right. You're not double spacing, or you're not writing in a complete heading, or you're leaving out page numbers. All of those things are required. We need those things in your essays. So that formatting guideline stuff is back in module one, although I did copy it and put it in module two as well. So you can find it in, in both places. So this essay is um, at least five paragraphs long, could be longer. You're practicing now for the first time using cause and effect argumentation, which is a type of argumentation that is pretty central to formalism. And you're going to be using cause and effect in basically all, all of your papers, including the departmental exam. We're also expanding your understanding of the elements of fiction. Paper one dealt with plot and central idea. Now we're moving on to conflict and character. Uh, central idea, I think, is you know one of the trickier elements of fiction to, to try to pin down. So we'll be continuing to work with central idea, you know, in our papers as we proceed. Finally. Um, let me remind you that formalism really urges us to consider that as long as we have a you know pretty fundamental understanding of certain terms, certain concepts, you know, like like a dynamic character, right? If you understand what that is, you can write about that in a story. Um, if you know what an internal conflict is, you can write about that in a paper like this. All you need is sort of a basic understanding of those terms and the story that's in front of you. We don't want you going out and doing research. There'll be a time for that. 
and we certainly don't want you hopping on to some, you know, page one hits from a Google search and reading about character and conflict in your story. You know, both Baldwin and Cather, both of those stories are famous stories. Uh, they've been taught, you know, for generations. And there's all kinds of stuff out there about them. Okay. But what I'm asking you to do is avoid going to these web pages and just reading what some schmuck says about these stories. Okay. I want to hear what you have to say about these stories. Don't, don't be afraid of being wrong. It's much better if you write what you think is going on and it's your writing, it's your ideas. We can clean that up in revision. That's much better than just ripping stuff off from a web page. And I'm going to tell you that I've already caught some students in paper one that did this. And I'm dealing with that. You don't want to be in that position. If you need help understanding what's going on in a story, ask. You can ask me. You can ask the writing tutors. Here's the link at the bottom of this assignment. You can get an online tutoring request form filled out. There's lots of writing tutors out there this summer just sitting in front of their computers waiting to help students. Believe me. Uh, you can also ask your fellow students. You know, go into Blackboard and email the class. Say, hey, I want to know what you guys think about this. Post uh, onto the discussion board. Invite your fellow students to chime in and help you. I think that's an excellent thing to do. And it's not maybe as easy to do since we're all online, but you know, your fellow classmates are an excellent resource that you should take advantage of, as are the tutors. So again, if you have any questions about these instructions, uh, please let me know. Go ahead and read the sample essay and watch those presentations. And this sort of template that we're introducing you in paper two, this pie pattern, this cause and effect. This is something you're going to see certainly in the next few papers. Now in paper three, we're going to also play around a little bit with what we call reader response. And you'll be writing some sort of more personal, um, expressive writing at the front end and the tail end of the essay, sort of the introduction and the conclusion. And that stuff is, I think, really fun to write. So we'll, we'll make your, your introductions a little bit more interesting than simply a, a long plot summary. Thank you for paying attention. And let me know if you have any questions, please.